All right, guys, happy Friday to you. I know you guys are eager, uh, eagerly awaiting the weekend. Um, I'm sure you are. It's probably been a very uh, challenging week, uh, but I appreciate your hard work. And even though I haven't been there, I know you guys have been working very hard. So today what we're going to do is we're going to start the second section of chapter 11, uh, 11B, and the title of it is solids. So this the whole chapter is about solids and liquids. And so the last section we'll talk about is liquids, but here we're going to talk about solids. So uh, get, get your notes ready to go. We're going to list a couple of properties of solids based on the kinetic molecular theory, relate uh, the structure of water molecule and how it works and the density changes as it becomes a solid. We're going to compare uh, 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 some terms called crystalline and amorphous solids. We're going to talk about the significance of something called a warming curve. And then we're going to describe what happens uh, during the melting, freezing, sublimation, and, and uh, deposition process, and then list some factors involving crystal lattice, and then list factors that affect lattice energy. So lots of things there. Those objectives I just read off of page 287. So, we're, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of things dealing with solids, and this isn't too hard of a section. It's a lot of terms. There's no application here, so you guys probably will enjoy that. It's just a matter of some terms and comprehension, really thinking through some things, okay? So here we go. Without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Particles in a solid are always moving and vibrating. We've already talked about this, and this fits the kinetic molecular theory. Molecules are constantly in motion. It doesn't matter what state of matter they're in. They're constantly moving. But with a solid, what takes place is the, the particles are moving very, very slowly. They're vibrating, but they're vibrating slowly in the sense that they're not really random like a gas. By the way, this is why a sound travels so much better off of solids than it does a gas. Now, I'm not going to have anybody do this, but you can try this on your own time. If you would take a book or stand up against the wall and start talking and start getting closer and closer and closer to the wall, what you're going to find out is your voice starts to become magnified. It seems like it's getting louder and louder and louder. Now, the reason that takes place is because the wall is a solid, or if you hold the book up to your face, it's a solid. So when you're speaking in sound waves, it has a lot to vibrate against. So it's literally bouncing off all of those particles, the sound waves are, which cause causes your voice to become magnified. It just gets louder. Versus talking out loud, our sound waves that we're producing is literally bouncing off all the gas particles in the room. So it's not quite as loud or doesn't sound quite as boisterous as we are when we're standing right up against the wall. Uh, it all has to do with the solid and how it vibrates against the solid atoms. And again, as the various solids are very tightly packed together, and that's why. That's why it sounds louder. A lot of people don't know that, but that's actually what takes place. And you guys could probably guess what happens if you remove all of the air, all of the gas in the particular room. You won't hear anything. We've already talked about this. Like in space, if you were to scream, again, hypothetically, because you, you would die from uh, either the pressure of uh, your your internal organs boiling and your or you would freeze from the temperature. If you scream, no one would hear you because there's no there's no gas particles in space. So unfortunately, it would be a very painful and a very quiet uh, undermise for you for you if that ever happened. So hopefully that never happened to anybody because uh, who knows maybe some of you get to space. I don't know. Anyways, particles in a solid are always moving and vibrating. That fits the molecular kinetic theory because uh, once they're in motion, they're, they're always going to stay in motion. Now, density of a solid, this is talked about on page 288 here. Solids resist compression. They don't want to be compressed because they're already tightly packed together. And we already know that. You can't take your hand and push it down on your desk so much that you compress your desk. Now, if you were to take a very high powerful uh, um, uh, machine of some kind and compress it and squeeze it and squeeze it, it you probably could... Uh, could squeeze it down even more, but there's gonna reach it's gonna reach its limit that you'll it won't be able to squeeze it anymore or compress it anymore simply because they resist compress compression. They don't want to be compressed. A substance is typically denser as the solid, uh, much solid than that as a liquid. Now there's only a few exceptions of, of this, and the only exception we talk about, the primary example, is water. Water is the only solid that is actually less dense than it is in a uh, less dense than it is in a in a liquid state than it is 
in a uh, solid state, vice versa is what I'm trying to say. Ice floats in water. Why? Because ice is less dense than water. You got a picture on page 288, a solid uh, frozen benzene. Um, uh, you could take anything. You could take alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, and put it in your freezer and freeze it, and it'll look like a cube of ice, but when you put it in a glass of water, it'll drop right down to the bottom because it's more dense. Uh, you, you might be, well, that's different substances. Well, if you took that uh, ice cube, not really an ice cube, but an alcohol cube, rubbing alcohol cube, and you were to pour uh, the rubbing alcohol in a glass and drop that cube in there, it would sink straight to the bottom. Water is the only exception. It floats. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with the hexagonal structure of its uh, solid form when it freezes. And we'll talk about that later. But it's pretty interesting. Most solids are more dense than their liquid state. Crystalline and amorphous solids, this is discussed uh, on the very bottom of page 288 and on the top of page 289. Just simple terms you have to remember. Crystalline solids have natural orderly shapes even when shattered, and they're typically from ionic and metallic solids. Uh, you see uh, some pictures. You see uh, uh, Galena in the uh, textbook 11-5. Galena is a lead-sulfur uh, combination, and you can see the actual uh, structure of it, the molecular structure there on the bottom of page 288. So again, make sure you're looking down there, 11-5. Uh, That's what it looks like based on its structure. And then you look at it magnified, or several of them stacked on top of each other, uh, and that's uh, the the galena there. You see that that black charcoal looking substance. That's galena. It's the lead mixed with the sulfur. So it has the same structure. It's still a crystalline structure. If you break it apart, it's still going to have that crystalline structure. That's technically what a crystalline solid is. So how about an amorphous solid? Top page two eighty nine. It talks about this. An amorphous solid has no distinct shape or underlining pattern. And some covalent compounds ex exhibit this. The picture in the textbook is a picture that many of you are probably familiar with, a shattered piece of glass. Now, that's a graduated cylinder that you see on uh, figure 11-6. And y'all know a cylinder, it's it's uh, cylindrical, looks like a cylinder. You, we've worked with, you've seen them in the lab uh, before. And what happens though is when it shatters, it breaks into random fragments. There's no structure to it. It's completely random. And that's what an amorphous solid is. It's completely random. Uh, they're typically formed. Uh, amorphous solids are often called super uh, cooled liquids uh, because... Uh, uh, basically, the liquid is cooled so fast that the particles have no time to form the crystal pattern, and uh, that's kind of why they're called a supercooled um, liquid. Uh, particles that are amorphous, such as rubber, plastic, asphalt, paraffin, which is wax, are amorphous solid even. They're not arranged in any particular pattern. It's random, and their structures result in a um, globular uh, microscopic shape. So it's just kind of like a, a blob. And when you look at it underneath a microscope, it's completely different than the crystalline. If you were to take uh, back to that uh, Galena example on the bottom of page 288, if you were to take a piece of that, look underneath a microscope, you would see more cubes or a uh, cubic structure. So that's the difference between an, an, a crystalline and an amorphous solid. Make sure you're very familiar with those. Um, continuing on here, freezing and melting. Uh, melting is the change from a solid to a liquid. Most of you know that, but get it down in your notes just in case you don't. Freezing is the change between a liquid to a solid. Uh, all, all items or objects have a melting point. Uh, for pure substances, the melting point is equal to the freezing point. So whatever the melting point is, that's also when it freezing. Again, don't get that confused. Students always get confused uh, melting and boiling point. They think those are the same thing. They are not the same thing. If I ask you guys a simple question, at what temperature does snow start to melt? Well, in Fahrenheit, y'all would say that's about 32 degrees. And you're right. Uh, snow, ice starts to melt at 32 degrees. But then if I ask you from the other perspective, at what temperature does water start to freeze? You would say, well, that's 32 degrees Celsius when you're right. It's about, it's the same regardless. It just depends on which way you're looking at it. If you're talking about the, the melting point or the freezing point, but they're the same. They're affected by the arrangement of the particles. So based on how they're arranged, will have an impact on them. Crystalline solids have a distinct melting point. You know exactly what temperature it's going to melt. 
Uh, here's an example of what's called a, a melting curve um, or a heating curve is sometimes how it's referred to. Uh, so you can see on or warming curve, it's all the same thing, warming, uh, heating curve. We're going to talk about it a little bit later when we get to thermodynamics. But you guys can see here what takes place. This is an example of a curve here. And um, what takes place here is you can look at the temperature. This is heat. So the x-axis here, think of this as nothing more than a Cartesian plane in math class. Now you may not want to think that, but that's basically what it is. The x-axis is heat energy. So as you go this direction, you're increasing the amount of heat. And then as you increase the amount of heat, the temperature actually goes up. So this section right here on this graph, incoming energy warms the solid. So let's say it's a piece of ice, you're warming it up, or it's it's the, the temperature's increasing, I should say, and right when it gets to a certain temperature, it's going to start to go through a phase change, and we're going to talk about this later, but it's basically all the energy is directed to the, the melting of the object. And then once it all is melted, it's going to start to heat up again. Think of ice, guys. Ice starts to melt, at, uh, and out into the temperature increases or rises to 32 degrees. And then what happens is once it hits 32, all the energy is going to be uh, shifted to changing the state. So the ice is going to start to melt and become a liquid. Once that li uh, once the liquid is formed and all the solid is gone, like water, then it starts to boil. It starts to increase in the temperature until it reaches that boiling point. But again, we'll talk about this specifically. This is just introducing what the curve is, and it's uh, showing you that there's a distinct um, melting point when it comes to a crystalline solid. Sublimation and uh, deposition here is talked about. Some people, it's deposition as well. Sublimation is the direct change from a solid to a gas. Deposition is the change from a gas to a solid. So just two more terms that you want to get down. They're on page 290. Um, <clears throat> the demonstration that I wanted to show you guys is actually in the textbook, 11-9. There's iodine crystals there on the bottom of the beaker. They start to heat it up, and it becomes a gas. And then once it touches that evaporating dish on the top of the beaker that's filled with ice, it changes immediately from a gas to a solid. It's really cool, and uh, I'm hoping to get a hold of some iodine so I can show that to you. But uh, it's a pretty neat demonstration. But it shows you the direct change from a um, solid to a gas and from a gas to a solid. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, going on here, continuing on here, just, those are just definitions you got to know. Crystalline lattice. Now, the crystalline lattice is with uh, the crystalline structures. So it's not with amorphous structures. It's only with crystalline structures. And at the bottom of page um, 290, you see several examples. You do need to know those, the seven basic classes of crystals, the cubic, the uh, tetragonal, uh, the rhombohedral, the triclinic, the monoclinic, the hexagonal, and the orthorhombic. You got to know all of those just for like a matching section. But it's basically the shape. I'll pick the simplest one, the cubic shape. The crystal lattice is defined as the simplest um, structure that a, uh, a, um, um, a solid can be broken down into. So it's the simplest one. Now, if you take it and basically it stacks on top of itself, and that's what the unit cell is. The unit cell, I said something incorrectly. The crystal lattice is all of it together. The unit cell is the simplified version of it. All those shapes at the bottom of page 290 would be examples of the unit cell. To help you understand what it's talking about, look on page 291. If you look on page 291, figure 11-12, you guys notice that it looks like it's the cubic shape, uh, but it's just stacked on top of each other. And that's exactly what it is. You have, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, if I'm counting right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I'm sorry. There's eight of them there on 11-12. And then when you remove one of them, that individual building block is called the unit cell. So they basically just stack on top of each other, and that's what you actually get the crystal lattice from. Uh, from stacking up the unit cells. Easy way to think about it. Some people think about it this way. I don't know. It depends on how you, if you guys remember anything, you can stack on top of each other. Um, like, uh, man, it could be anything like um, building blocks uh, that are the same exact sh shape and size. You just stack them on top of each other to make uh, a bigger shape. Or like take a sugar cube and start stacking sugar cubes on top of each other to make a bigger cube. The whole big cube 
of sugar would be the crystal lattice. But if one of those sugar cubes would be the example of the unit cell. I hope that helps you understand what it's talking about. It's not super hard, but just some terms that you definitely want to get down. I actually had it on my slide. I forgot I had it here. So the whole structure, uh, this entire structure would be considered the crystal lattice. But you can see one of those sections right here that I'm coloring in is what would be called the unit cell. So this is the unit cell, makes up a bunch of them stacked on top of each other, and you end up with the crystal lattice. So that's how that works. Okay, there is variations within crystal lattices. There can be up to 14 lattices on top of each other. We're not going to get that complex, but the crystals often assume the shape of their unit cell, just like we had on the previous slide. The, the basic unit cell was a cubic um, sh uh, shape, so the structure of the crystal lattice or the crystals themselves would be also cubic in nature. So that's the idea behind that. Okay, moving right along, some more terms to get down, polymorphous and allotropes here. Polymorphous are elements or compounds that can form more than one type of crystal lattice. So sometimes you can have a compound, and it based on the temperature or based on the way it's, it's, uh, it's, it's fashioned, it can have different shapes. So maybe one time it's going to form the cubic shape, the cubic crystal, uh, unit cell, but then you go through another process, and it may be the, the monoclinic shape. So polymorphous, poly meaning many, morphous meaning uh, transform or metamorphosize to, ch to change, it can, has many changes. It can, the crystal lattice can change to different shapes. So polymorphous, it can be many different things. Sulfur is a good example of this. If you look in uh, on page 292, you see the yellow sulfur there. It looks like a cube, uh, the yellow sulfur. And then you look on the right picture there. That's sulfur. It's the same thing. It's just formed a different crystal lattice because it has a different crystal, uh, the, the unit cell. So it's pretty cool how it works. I could also show you the manufacturing of that, but it's actually sulfur is toxic, and uh, that's why I'm not going to mess with it in the lab. It also smells pretty bad, too. But polymorphous elements are elements that, that ha can have different uh, shapes in their crystal lattice. Allotropic elements are pure elements that, that is polymorphous. Okay, so don't get confused here. Allotropes are polymorphous, okay? Not all crystal lattice are polymorphous, okay? But if you have an allotrope, then you know it's polymorphous. The specific piece of allotropic is it's a pure element. I mentioned sulfur. Sulfur 8 by itself is considered allotropic because it's one element. That's all it is. It's just one element. Versus uh, maybe the previous example, the, um, the, uh, the, the Gelna, which was the the PB lead bonded to sulfur. Gelna there is an example. It's not a pure element. So this possibly could be polymorphous, but it would not be allotropic. However, if it is allotropic, which this one is because sulfur exists in multiple crystal lattices, it's also polymorphous. It's polymorphous and it's also allotropic. So you can have something that is polymorphous, but not allotropic. I hope that's making sense. This could be polymorphous, but it cannot be allotropic because it is not a uh, individual, a pure element. Here, sulfur is a pure element, so it could be allotropic. That's the idea of what it's talking about. I hope that makes sense. All allotropic elements are polymorphous, but not all polymorphous elements are allotropic. Okay? All right. I hope that makes sense to you. Almost done here. Binding forces in crystals. The attractions can be weak or strong. It's based on the lattice energy. Lattice energy is the energy released when gaseous particles form crystals. So every single mineral we find in the ground uh, or precious stone, really the precious stone or jewel, is caused by uh, an encapsulation of gas. That's actually what gives it its color. Uh, diamonds are clear. You can find diamonds with all kinds of color because a yellow diamond, a pink diamond, which is the most valuable diamond. You got the blue-red diamond, which is up there as well. They trap gas inside of them, and that's what actually gives them a different color.
the, when the crystals melt, the thermal energy is used to overcome the bonding forces. So you melt the crystals, and that's what actually will form the uh, the different um, uh, the, the different crystals in the terms of when you have different uh, types of crystal solids. And that's what uh, the question. A couple questions here. What makes a crystal strong? The magnitude of the electrical charges. If it has bond, uh, bonds, uh, the, the the bonds that are very strong, which it will as um, if it's an uh, ionic bond or metallic bond. Remember from the previous lesson, they'll have a very high boiling point and melting point. So they're very strong. Their electrical charges. The sizes of the particles. How big are they? And then the ge uh, the geometric structure of the crystals. We've already talked about this as well. If it is um, polar, it's going to have a slightly higher melting point and boiling point than a nonpolar molecule. Again, remember that chart or remember the diagram I drew up on the screen of uh, the last lesson. So that's what makes a crystal strong. Uh, so there are some types of crystals here. You just need to know these by definition. I'm not going to ask you any application from this. In fact, all of this uh, chapter here, you don't really need to know any I'm sorry, not chapter. This section, section B, you don't have to know any application. So uh, you'll probably find that convenient. You'll have the atomic crystals. This forms only when noble gases freeze. So you got your noble gases on the far right side of the periodic table elements. When those uh, form uh, freeze, when those gases freeze, like helium, for instance, if it freezes, it's called an atomic crystal. Um, that's because... Um, Usually, uh, they they are very soft and they're poor conductors of electricity because they're very stable. They're uh, most of them are inert, so that's kind of the the way that works. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Uh, you have covalent molecule crystals. This is obviously when you have a covalent bond. Their atoms held together by it could be dipole dipole force, hydrogen bonds, or dispersion force. So if you have um, like hydrochloric acid, and I were to freeze that and make it a solid then it would be considered a covalent molecular uh, crystal. The next one is a covalent network crystal. Some nonmetallic elements, and they function like a giant molecule. The most commonly uh, known covalent network crystal, it's basically a stacking up of the same crystal structure. A diamond is the best example of this. You can see it, 11-16, on the very bottom of page 293. Diamonds are covalent networks made up of carbon atoms that are just bonded together. Uh, carbon um, is linked together and it forms a diamond. We also know that it also that same compound forms uh, coal or um, so in people are like, well, what's the difference in coal and a diamond? And y'all probably already know this. We already talked about it a little bit. It's that pressure that's uh, added to the, the charcoal basically or the, the coal and it pressure presses it and condenses even more to, to form a harder substance, which would be the diamond. So if, if, if it's a molecule uh, that has it stacked on top of each other, like the carbon molecule, then it's called a covalent network crystal. Ionic crystals are repeating networks of ions, ions de, uh, defined by the unit cell. So that's one we've already talked about. Salt would be a good example of this. If you look at salt underneath a microscope, it looks just like a cube because that's its actual molecular structure, a cube. Uh, so it's a cube stacked on top of each other. But salt, as we remember, is NaCl, sodium chloride. So it's an ionic bond. So that would be an example. And they're usually very strong, have a very high boiling point, again, because they're ionic in nature. And then you have one more called the metallic crystal. This is when it's a positive ion in a sea of valence electrons. The valence electron C theory is what this is talking about. So it's just another example of a crystal. If I have a metal bonded to a metal it's going to form a crystal structure, and it's called a metallic crystal. So, again, just definitions there, not that difficult. Uh, just make sure you know those definitions and you're good to go. Well, that's it, guys. That's Section B. Uh, no homework tonight. I know you're probably excited about that. I know you guys are working on your science projects. So if I had to sign anything, it would be to work on your science projects. Make sure you're working on those. You should have gathered all your materials by now, and you should be uh, go ahead and test those and test your experiment. Remember, you got to repeat your experiment multiple times to um, build validity in your results. Also, guys, make sure on your science projects, you're recording data. You got to be recording something. You're not just doing a demonstration. You're not just making a volcano or you're not just, uh, I, I know uh, Justin's doing his on Mentos and the reaction that they have with um, uh, with soda. 
you can't just put Mentos in, in soda and watch it uh, launch off and that's all you do. You got to be measuring something because you got to be trying to figure out a situation, what, what would make the reaction more violent or uh, what would uh, happen if I changed this particular component. You got to have variables, got to have a controlled group. So you got to make sure you're doing that and recording that data in your logbook so that you can transfer it to maybe some uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a graph that you guys can put on your display boards. So make sure you're working hard on that. Again, when I get back, I know some of you still may have some questions about that. So feel free to, uh, uh, to ask me on Monday when I get back if you're having some trouble with your science projects. But you definitely want to use this time I'm giving you over the weekend to work on that. Hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the day. And, man, have a, have a good weekend, guys. I know you all worked hard this week. And I uh, pr- uh, hope and pray that you guys have an awesome weekend and look forward to seeing you guys on Monday.